Hello. This is lecture number 13 of our optimization course. We will first uh, summarize the method you will learn till now, the methods of unconstrained optimization. It will be a rather short summary. And then we will pass to major topic, the second half of our course, uh, optimization with constraints. Okay, let's start from a summary of uh, uncon unconstrained optimization methods, which we already learned. So we first uh, started with uh, one-dimensional optimization, 1D methods. And uh, we told that if we have one-dimensional function, we only are able to compute function values in given points, uh, no derivatives. Then uh, a very good method of choice is golden section. section, no derivatives. If uh, we know derivatives, so we can say that the uh, optimality condition is when derivative is zero, and we will use a method which finds zero of nonlinear function, and the most simple method is uh, bisection. If we uh, suppose that our function is well approximated by quadratic or cubic polynomial, which is actually uh, right for smooth functions around the minimum, then uh, a uh, good thing would be to use uh, quadratic or cubic interpolation methods. Mm -hmm. Quadratic or cubic interpolation. I just remind in two words, uh, quadratic interpolation may be used uh, also when we have no derivatives, we just uh, on the base of uh, values of function in some three points, we can match parabola and uh, go for minimum of this parabola, this will give new point and choose right three points then and uh, continue. And uh, cubic interpolation could use, for example, four points, but uh, rather often it used two points, but also two, two slopes, so it's good uh, when you have derivatives to use cubic in interpolation. And uh, for many methods of uh, multidimensional optimization, when uh, uh, 1D line search is a part of the method, and rather often people say that Inexact, uh, inexact uh, 1D optimization may be rather good, so it's inexact line search. And uh, what we learned as example, uh, so-called backtracking method. Uh, with the uh, RMEO stopping rule.
Okay. Now uh, we will remind the multi uh, multi-dimensional uh, unconstrained optimization methods. So first, uh, the simplest one is uh, steepest descent. It's uh, just a uh, move in direction of minus gradient and do proper, uh, maybe in exact line search in order to avoid uh, increase of function or even this fixed step uh, size uh, redu which uh, uh, so-called diminishing step size which goes to, to zero uh, while uh, some of uh, steps should uh, go to infinity and uh, the disadvantage of this method is uh, when uh, function level sets are like narrow valley I mean, Hessian is uh, ill-posed, so gradient starts uh, zigzagging and uh, slowly to converge. The remedy, we learned Newton method, which is uh, much better for ill-posed problems. And uh, special case uh, uh, when we deal with uh, least squares problems uh, we had a specialized version of Newton method approximation to Newton methods which uh, was called Gauss-Newton and others like Levinberg markert of this family um, then we told that uh, Newton method requires uh, at every step solution of large system of linear equations of size n by n if we do n dimensional optimization and uh, for problems uh, which are much more than thousand or several thousands it may be already too difficult for modern computers so that's, uh, that's why we learned as an alternative uh, conjugate gradient methods conjugate gradient uh, so it's a method for minimization of quadratic function but also for is has a generalization for minimization of uh, general smooth nonlinear function and uh, another use of conjugate gradient came in so-called truncated Newton in truncated Newton conjugate gradient is used in order to solve linear system of equation, Newton system probably in exactly with limited number of steps that's why it's called uh, truncated and uh, also we told that if we have some idea of approximate uh, inverse Hessian which is easy to compute then uh, use it, multiply gradient by this uh, approximate inverse and this is called preconditioning And it's, re it's really helpful, so in practice, if you have possibility to use it, then do it. Uh, so, another powerful fa uh, family is uh, so-called uh, quasi-Newton methods. when uh, at every iteration we build a matrix which approximates he Hessian or even approximates uh, inverse of Hessian and uh, the most popular uh, version of quasi-Newton is so-called BFGS method 
and I, I will put it in parentheses. It's like one of options. And uh, I, I would say that for problems of moderate size, for several uh, till several hundred or maybe few thousands of variables, uh, quasi Newton often behaves like the best. It may be first choice to try. And it's uh, implemented in function f minang of uh, MATLAB optimization toolbox. And uh, also we learned uh, so called uh, sequential subspace optimization. So, uh, so uh, sometimes it's called uh, shortly SESOP. And uh, it is uh, another generalization, it can be considered as another generalization of conjugate gradients to the minimization of uh, smooth uh, non quadratic function. And the idea I remind was uh, to use a subspace of a gradient of in the current point and uh, directions of few previous iterations and do optimization in this subspace. It's an optimization in small number of variables. It's like uh, dimension of this subspace, the minimal would be two. And uh, in case of quadratic function, it would behave exactly like conjugate gradient. And this method would be uh, very efficient, especially when uh, the objective function has this uh, kind of uh, structure, uh, say f of x is uh, some function, some nonlinear function of a linear uh, operator of x where the most uh, numerical computation is uh, in computing function is to apply this operator. Then, when we search in subspace, we don't need to do another multiplication by x, and in this case, this method may be more efficient than others, and uh, it may work for really large problems with hundreds of thousands and uh, millions of variables. Again, for very large problems, those three methods are worth to try. Conjugate gradient, truncated Newton, and sequential subspace optimization. When we have uh, till thousand, more or less, try quasi-Newton and Newton, and only if you want to do something really simple, try gradient descent. Steepest descent. And uh, we didn't learn in our course, but I need, I have to mention, when you don't have derivatives, only function values, for problem of moderate size, or even I would say small size, till uh, 10 or several tens of variables, uh, this method, Nelder and Mead simplex method, maybe a method of choice. So it's good because it doesn't require uh, no need of derivatives. But for larger problems with hundreds or thousands of, uh, of variables, it may become rather slow and again, I want to stress, if one has possibility to compute derivatives, for example, to compute gradient in, in analytical form, just do it, because uh, typically computation of gradient 
takes about the same number of computation as computation of objective function. And even uh, multiply arbitrary vector by Hessian, for example, what's needed for a truncated Newton method, is also about as one function computation. If for some technical reasons you cannot do it, or rest the restriction of time, then uh, for small problems it's very reasonable to try. Simplex method. Okay, now, like I told, we pass to the second part of our course dedicated to constraint optimization or optimization with constraints. Like in uh, unconstrained case, we will learn uh, first uh, optimality conditions and then methods which are efficient for solving these problems. So, how it can be written in general? Uh, we will consider fun um, problems with so-called functionality constraints. So, for example, we like to minimize a function of n variables x is n-dimensional Euclidean vector. Uh, subject to, written as t, some other functions, for example, gi of x, are less than equal to zero. For example, i i is uh, 1 to m. And uh, other nonlinear functions, say hi or hj of x are equal to 0. And uh, j 1 to k. So, this function we will call f objective function. Sometimes it's called cost function. And uh, gi we will call inequality constraints and uh, hj equality constraints and uh, from now to simplify our exposition, we will uh, consider first uh, problems with uh, inequality constraints only, and then uh, generalization will be rather straightforward. Okay, so let's uh, concentrate on the problem was just inequality constraints. So, we, we will try to understand geometry of this problem. Uh, for this, we, we will need to draw level sets of, uh, of F and level sets of uh, GI uh, when uh, GI is zero. So, for example, uh, say this is a level set of uh, G1 we follow my uh, picture here for example this uh, is a level set of G1 this is G1 of 
x is equal to 0. And uh, we will uh, write, uh, draw it sim symbolically. This is area where it's uh, greater than 0, and uh, this is uh, area where it's uh, less or equal to, z to 0. so-called feasible area. It will satisfy our restriction on x. And uh, let's continue it. And for example, uh, this is the same of uh, g2. So it's uh, g2 is equal to 0. And for example, inside and this part is less than zero. And uh, we'll publish our picture. For example, we have three constraints. And this is this is uh, G three equal to zero. What is inside is called feasible set. Axes uh, which are in this area, they satisfy constraint. All constraints. So we call this area feasible set. And uh, let's draw, for example, Level sets of our objective function. Maybe I will do it by another color. Uh, for example, this would be a minimum of my objective function f if there would be no constraints. And uh, this is uh, level sets of it. It may be somehow prolongated. And uh, some level set, uh, for example, intersects uh, a feasible set of my problem. And uh, I will ask question, how I can graphically express the solution? I, I need to look for the lowest level set it still have some uh, common points with my feasible set. So this one would satisfy, but maybe there is a lo uh, lower function value. So the lowest level set simply will touch my feasible set. And uh, this should be a solution. I would uh, denote it like x star and uh, one more interesting observation from this we already learned that uh, gradients of functions are if you have smooth function with gradient uh, the gradient is orthogonal to the level set so if we consider a gradient of f at this point, it looks like this one. Yes. This gradient of f. Why in this direction? Because gradient looks in direction of function increase. So what happened with in this point? Here will be a gradient of f. Gradient. And uh, what if I would ask about gradient of G1? G1 is zero in solution, by the way, and it's called active constraint. It really influences uh, continuously our solution. And uh, two other constraints, they are passive. At this point, uh, when we change a bit those two functions, it will not change. 
uh, our x. And if we look what is the gradient of active constraints, so we told that g is uh, decreasing here and increasing here. But it's uh, orthogonal to the level set. So it will look like this. And this is the uh, gradient of g1 of x. You see, be be because uh, those two level sets touch each other, the gradients are collinear. And I, I, I would say in this simple example, uh, gradient of f well, uh, at the point x star is just some uh, multiply by uh, gradient of g of x star, or, or I can write it in in uh, in other way, because some multiply of gradient of g is equal to zero. Okay, and uh, now I, I draw uh, another a bit uh, more general situation when uh, level sets of uh, objective function they touch feasible set at the point where two constraints are active. So in this case, uh, gradient of f is uh, sum of minus gradients of uh, delta G2 and delta G1 with some uh, weights and uh, I can uh, write in, ge in general uh, that uh, gradient of F plus uh, sum of uh, uh, lambda I gradients of G I at X star I uh, belongs to sets of indexes of active constraints uh, is equal to zero. So for non-active constraints G3, for example, it will not come uh, into this summation. Or alternatively, we can say that this multiplier, which we we'll call Lagrange multiplier for non-active constraints will be zero. Uh, and this expression, actually, we can uh, look on it as a derivative of function which is called Lagrangian. Let me make some space here. So, I will define the function Lagrangian. Which is uh, L of X and Lambda. Which is uh, exactly F of X plus some uh, uh, Lambda I G I of X. Sum over i, we can summarize over all constraints, but uh, remember that its solution for non active this will be zero. And uh, so, this condition it's, it will just say that uh, gradient with respect to x of L at the point x star. And optimal Lagrange multipliers, lambda star, uh, will be zero. Yes, it's gradient of f plus sum of lambda i gradient of g. And it's uh, one of uh, the most important uh, so called optimality conditions. Okay.
Now we are ready to express uh, famous Karsh Kuntaker first order necessary optimality conditions for the problem of minimizing uh, objective function subject to first we will state for inequality constraints so uh, we will for formulate it in the following way suppose that x star is an optimal solution and uh, gradients of uh, active constraints are linearly independent then exists an optimal uh, uh, vector of Lang Lagrange multipliers lambda star uh, such that uh, as we already told gradient with respect to x Lagrangian of uh, x star lambda star is zero and uh, of course uh, x star should be feasible mean g of x star is uh, less or equal to zero here we use a vectorized notation instead of writing gi uh, of x less than equal to zero we consider a vector function and uh, this means that all components of this vector should be uh, less or equal than zero uh, now regarding uh, Lagrange multipliers like we saw from the picture, they should be non-negative. The, the gra gra gradients, roughly speaking, should uh, look in the same direction as the uh, uh, minus uh, gradient. Uh, uh, minus gradients of constraints should look in the same direction as gradient of objective function. So lambda star is uh, greater or equal uh, to zero for inequality constraints. quality constraints and uh, lambda star should be zero uh, for uh, non-active constraints And uh, actually, those conditions we can express uh, in uh, another formula, which I will write. Uh, sum of uh, lambda i star g i of x star should be zero why it is correct because if a constraint is non-active so it's uh, strictly less than zero then uh, Lagrange multiplier should be zero and this product uh, will be zero and uh, for active constraints Lagrange multiplier may be not zero but active means that at, uh, at solution g itself is zero so this like summarize uh, the properties we wrote before but this expression is very important for further analysis and uh, it uh, has its, no, its own name uh, complementary slackness Now, 
we are ready to consider a first uh, general approach to solution of uh, constraint optimization problem the so-called uh, penalty function method and we will start again with inequality constraints then we will pass to equality uh, for our annotation it will be good to write this problem in the following way uh, minimize over uh, g where g is feasible set f of x our objective function and g we express uh, by conditions of feasibility so x's which satisfy all constraints and then for this problem we will we will um, introduce a penalty uh, which originally will be one dimensional function we will penalize every constraint separately for x violating this constraint and then uh, put all these penalties together so we define the penalty function Uh, say it's phi one dimensional r to r and uh, even we'll give you picture first some example of plot of this function function which will looks uh, in this way for example this one variable we will call t and this is phi of t uh, so we, we like uh, function not to penalize uh, the arguments which are negative which corresponds to points in feasible set, set and penalize arguments which are positive but also uh, the, the this like basic function it's phi 1 of t and actually we will define a family of functions in in the in the in the way that penalty more and more will become close to so-called ideal penalty and uh, th this for example is like phi p of t this plot where p larger than 1 yeah. sorry uh, yes in my notation is larger than 1 and uh, when p when parameter will go to infinity we will go to, uh, we will get a function which like corner which actually what we like ideally we like uh, to restrict our points to be inside of feasible set but not uh, influence uh, solution when we are really inside to be zero inside to get this fa fa family we get we start with uh, arbi arbitrary function like phi, phi 1 of t or we uh, just may write uh, phi of t uh, and we will define it by properties so it's uh, convex uh, monotone uh, and smooth because we will use it for unconstrained optimization so we like penalty to be smooth and uh, we like it to penalize uh, strictly large values and uh, I, I will express it in the way as limit uh, an argument goes to infinity uh, derivative phi prime of t is uh, infinity and uh, for small values opposite I like not to influence much so uh, the third property is limit uh, t goes 
to minus infinity phi prime of t is zero. And um, just for normalization properties, just to ease our notation, it's not re required in, g in general, but it's uh, convenient to, to do it. We like this function to pass uh, the region and, for example, to have a standard slope in the region. Uh, so I, I write it in the way uh, phi of zero is zero and uh, phi prime of zero is one. And like I told, actually I want a parametric family of function. So I introduce a penalty parameter P uh, which is uh, a scalar I can write it this way non-negative scalar R plus for positive scalar yeah. more accurately so, axis of a uh, set of positive numbers often people define in this way so and just one of very convenient examples how I can uh, parameter uh, to define parametric penalty if I have uh, this basic function is uh, just saying that uh, phi p of t is uh, equal uh, 1 over p phi of p t. It's very convenient way, but it's not only way. For example, we can use it. Uh, how do we see that uh, really uh, when uh, p is large, this penalty becomes more and more steep? Let's try to see what is the first derivative with respect to t. Phi prime p of t. Uh, p and 1 over p cancels and uh, we just have it's equal to phi prime of our original function of p t. So what happens when uh, p is very large? Even uh, for small numbers, uh, for small values of t or for moderate values of t, this argument becomes very large. And uh, we see when argument is very large, uh, phi prime is uh, going to infinity. It means that even shifting a bit in positive direction we will cause uh, to function become very steep. And uh, opposite, if p is very large and t is negative, this is a very large negative and uh, derivative will be close to zero. So we really see that it uh, should approach this uh, ideal penalty. Okay. And now I want only to give uh, you examples of uh, function phi, which are practical in uh, optimization. Uh, the most known is uh, exponential penalty. Uh, phi is uh, just e to the power t and minus 1 for normalization. So we see when t is 0, this is 0, and its derivative is 1, and it will grow very fast as t grows, and uh, as e to the minus t become uh, very, uh, very shallow when t goes to minus infinity. And... Uh, but 
uh, dealing with uh, exponents in numerical computations is uh, not always convenient uh, for several reasons. One of them is that uh, if uh, this argument is large, for example, thousand or few thousands, you can easily get uh, above the largest number in computer. So you should take very special numerical care of this not, not to happen. On the other hand, if you minimize your penalty with some uh, unconstrained optimization methods, you don't like its uh, higher derivative. For example, we use Newton method, so we don't like third derivatives to become very large. And uh, this, unfortunately, what will happen with exponent. Another Another good choice, uh, it would be function which uh, which uh, behaves when t is large, like a quadratic par parabola, but uh, when t is very negative, this is a, bra a branch which is Synthesized somehow of logarithm function. And this function is uh, very practical and very good for computation. So I symbolically will write this log, despite it's not exactly log, it's some a bit tra transformed log. Uh, so it's phi of t. It's only one uh, particular example, actually, one can build a whole family of such functions. Uh, is uh, one half t squared plus t for t greater or equal uh, minus uh, one half so this point of joint is minus one half and uh, otherwise it will be minus 1 over 4 log uh, minus 2t minus 3 eighths. So this is otherwise. This function is good because uh, it's smooth. Uh, it's uh, built in this way that derivatives of both branches are equal in this point where joint happens, and even second derivatives. That's why it's uh, good and very convenient for optimization. Now, uh, when we have defined our penalty, and uh, again, uh, I will write um, as uh, p goes to infinity, our penalty becomes an ideal penalty. I will write it symbolically, phi p of t uh, goes to phi, I would say, infinity of t, which is an uh, ideal penalty in the sense uh, that it's uh, zero when uh, argument uh, is feasible, less equal to zero, and it's infinity for t greater than zero. And this is called ideal penalty. Now we can uh, build a so-called penalty aggregate.
So we will just sum, uh, we, uh, so we said fp of ax, we just sum our objective function f of ax and uh, penalties for our constraints. Sum of uh, over all constraints i from 1 to m, phi p of g i of x. And idea of penalty method is very simple. You choose some moderate value of p, you minimize this fp of x by some unconstrained method, then you increase p, for example, three times or ten times, whatever, and again get to the minimum of p of x and continue. And uh, in this process you will uh, get more and more close to solution and if you like really great numerical accuracy in your solution, you will get to the values of p, maybe million or ten millions. And ideally, you will get to the ideal penalty aggregate when p goes to infinity. Ideal penalty aggregate. And this is, uh, we will de denote it as f infinity of x is uh, equal, uh, again I just rewrite this, f of x plus um, sum i from 1 to n phi infinity of g i I can write it in short way that this is expression is equal to f of ax for feasible axis because when x feasible this is uh, less or equal to zero and this uh, term vanish. Uh, what is feasible axis? Here, uh, x in g x in feasible set. And uh, infinity otherwise. Now you see a whole picture which looks uh, rather reasonable. Okay? You drive your penalty parameter to very large numbers and uh, ideally to infinity and then you will uh, minimize in x actually we try to get to a situation where we minimize in x f infinity of x it's not practical numerically, it's only symbolically I can do it, but it is equivalent to minimize over x uh, infeasible set f of x. So these two problems are equivalent. And this is the uh, main justification to use the penalty function method. And uh, just to summarize, I will uh, formally, actually not very formally, describe the penalty function algorithm. So you start from some moderate uh, value of penalty parameter p0 
and some reasonable uh, initial x, x0, which you might get by some other physical considerations uh, for your problem. It uh, don't have to be feasible, but desirably to be more close as possible to feasible set. And then you will iterate. So at some iteration k, you just uh, minimize uh, approximately. You typically cannot find the exact minimum approximately with some method for unconstrained optimization, Newton uh, conjugate gradient, uh, truncated Newton forever. Um, uh, your penalty ag aggregate and uh, of course you start your unconstrained minimization from previous it iterate and uh, then you just increase uh, penalty parameter say 2 or 10, 10 times it's practical rule and uh, repeat this process till uh, penalty will achieve uh, penalty parameter will achieve uh, relatively um, reasonably large number and this should bring you to good uh, accuracy of solving your problem um, the only thing I wanted to mention that uh, when parameter uh, a penalty parameter becomes very large then unconstrained optimization may become more and more difficult and this somehow restricts uh, accuracy of the method despite of reasonably large accuracy can be achieved and uh, the next lecture we will come to uh, methods which called uh, augmented Lagrangian or modified Lagrangian uh, which actually will uh, deliver solution without uh, growing uh, penalty parameter to infinity and uh, of good use for very very accurate uh, solution of problems so see you next time Ta-da! <laughs>